Hi, I'm Karen, and I would like to welcome you to our virtual edition of Family Science Night today. Um, our programs here in the Greenbelt are funded through generous donations from Con Edison, so we'd like to give them a great big thank you for continuing to support our programming here. So again, my name is Karen, and I'd like to introduce some of my co-educators here. Hi, I'm Angel. Hello, I'm Chris. And I am also Chris. Okay, so tonight what we have for you is something called a Rube Goldberg machine, which you have probably seen before but may not know the name of it. Um, Chris and Angel are going to talk a little bit about that a little bit later. But what you will learn from doing tonight's science experiment is some basic principles of physics, engineering, and mechanics. So it's a really fun way to learn those things. You're also going to see in action conservation of energy. So the energy that is put into the beginning of our machine here is going to make its way all the way down to the end and do the task that we would like it to do. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it to Angel so she can tell you all about the Rube Goldberg machine. So a little bit of history. Rube Goldberg was an American cartoonist born at the turn of the 19th century. And his illustrations became very popular for their ridiculously intricate and elaborate machines that he drew impeccably to accomplish the simplest of tasks. So some examples of that would have been the self-operating napkin, or the self-orange juice squeezing machine, or the self-closing window. And so his illustrations became synonymous with the idea of maximum effort equaling minimal result. And we have our own most simple mundane task to accomplish here today. Now, if you've ever watched any movies, you might have seen the Rube Goldberg machine without recognizing it. For example, as far back in 1936, you have Charlie Chaplin making his own hands-off breakfasting machine. If you've seen uh, Beauty and the Beast, Belle's father tries to create the automatic woodcutting machine. And a famous part in the uh, Indiana Jones movie where the ball rolls down the hill chasing Indiana down the cave, that's the last part of their Rube Goldberg machine. Uh, you might also recognize it from the board game Mousetrap, where you have to try to capture your opponent's mouse before they trap yours. So here we have the fifth member of our family science night team, Flower, who is our red-eared slider. And so as Angel mentioned earlier, the objective of Rube Goldberg is to complete a mundane task. And so today we're going to utilize our entire machine to feed Flower. So stay tuned as we take part in the first action to accomplish this experiment. In order to begin our Rube Goldberg machine, we had to think about a couple different scientific mechanics, mostly within the field of physics. So to start off the actions, what we designed here is a basic pulley system. Now pulley systems can be really complex or really simple. But what we have up here is a piece of scotch tape that is holding back a string on a bob, which is part of our pendulum, 
But if we follow this string back, which doesn't have full tension, so there's a little bit of slack in the line tied over to this doorknob. Now, if you ever watch some old sitcoms or cartoons where people used to tie a string around a piece of tooth and put it on a doorknob and open it to pull that tooth, of course, today with dentistry and our hygiene practices, we know that you shouldn't tie your tooth to a doorknob. But thinking about those old sitcoms and TV shows, we utilize the same pulley system and the same tension in order to remove this piece of tape that's acting as a trigger. And the way we're able to do that is by using the force of the door opening inwards to pull tension on this slack line and to release our trigger. So as you saw in that last segment, we utilize tension along this string tied to a doorknob to pull that tension and release our next action. And so our next action here is known as a pendulum. And so when thinking about designing a pendulum for this Rube Goldberg, we had to look into physics. And so all of you may have experienced a pendulum, whether you know it or not. Has anybody ever been to a park or a playground? If you've ever enjoyed an afternoon swinging on a swing set, you too have experienced what it means to be a pendulum. And so a pendulum is a object that's set on a fixed pivot and through the forces of gravity has the ability to move. So a pendulum acting under the action of gravity allows it to create that momentum. So like this ball being thrown up into the air, gravity moves objects back towards the earth. Did you all know if we didn't have gravity, you, me, a goat, a ball, or a tree might just float off the planet completely. And so it is through gravity that's working on our fixed object that we're able to witness what it means to be part of a pendulum. As mentioned before, we're gonna start with our object. So whether that object is a person, a ball, or a weight, the object is going to be the part of the pendulum that moves. On a pendulum, this object is called a bob. So the bob is set on the beginning, and moving upwards in a very straight line is leading to our friction point. So our friction point is going to be connected by a string. As your bob sits on the bottom in this still arrested position, that's known as your equilibrium position. So like Newton said, an object will stay at rest unless something else causes it to move. Now, as we saw before, a pendulum can move outwards with its bob, again, being the force that is being moved by an action or gravity. This is known as the bob's trajectory. So it can move in this direction and the bob can move in this direction as well. Up here again, this is known as your friction pivot. And then along here, when we're thinking about this action, this is called amplitude. Right, so amplitude is a periodic motion and is the maximum displacement of the equilibrium, right? So if we're staying here in our center, based on your pivot point, is going to be the maximum amount of trajectory that your bob can move based on a couple different factors. What you need to take into consideration are things like physical forces at play, which includes friction. Even this string or line pushing against air 
can cause friction. And over time, just like if you were on a swing, you would eventually stop back at your equilibrium position. Other things such as push, pull, and tension will also play a factor in your pendulum's movement. Energy has the ability to cause motion and create change. So if you're gonna pull your bob really, really far back, that action is gonna create more momentum, which is gonna make sure that your amplitude is actually larger. And then as it works against gravity and friction, it will come back to a rest position. Other variables to take into consideration are also weight, string length, angle, and distance. So now that we looked at the mechanisms that allow a pendulum to work, let's look at what our objective is. So as part of this larger group Goldberg, our hope with our pendulum is that we'll be able to pop this balloon, which will create an action and continue that action throughout our course. So our pendulum here is a little bit different in the sense that we have this trigger mechanism we mentioned earlier, and our object has a bunch of pins in it, which along with its momentum will allow us to pop the balloon and create the next action. So again, we see our pivot, our line, and our object. And so now, because we dismounted our trigger string, I'm just going to show us how a pendulum will work. So again, you have your object, you have the forces of gravity and tension, and then I'm going to release And there's action. So now that we looked at the actions of a pendulum, let's take a look at the action that follows. So over here, as you witnessed before, we have a balloon that was popped by the mace attached to our pendulum. So now let's look at the science of popping a balloon. Have any of you ever popped a balloon? What's it like? What does it sound like? Is it scary? Do you jump? What's going on when a pin enters a balloon? In order to understand the science behind the popping of a balloon, we have to look into a form of physics known as fracture mechanics. So when you take a pin and you're popping a balloon, that action is known as catastrophic crack propagation. Whoa, that's a tongue twister. But essentially what that means is that as the pressure is being pushed out of a balloon from your pinhole, it's not the air itself that causes it to pop, but the expansion of the rubber based on tension and pressure. And let's take a little closer look at what that means. So here we have our lovely balloon, which is neatly tied up at the bottom. And there's our balloon. Here's our little shiny section. As the tension and pressure is put outward on the elastic. And so what's going on here? We're talking about the idea of sticking a pin or other shop or object into the balloon. So what is occurring within the balloon? Well, air within the balloon is at a high pressure. That pressure is higher than the surrounding area because of the elastic tension of the balloon pulling inward. So if we imagine at the center of our balloon, this elastic, which is being pushed out by air pressure, is still holding its form. So it's pushing inward. At the same time, the air that we blew into the balloon wants to expand outward in a uniformed spherical type shape, which is keeping the balloon within its form. Now that the high pressure is being released from our pin, we have the air pressure escaping the tension of the elastic. And what that's causing it to do is actually crumble our rubber elastic in a backwards direction. It's the creation of this pressure that's exiting through the balloon that comes in the sound of a sound wave our ears hear as a pop.
Awesome. So now that we've discussed the science behind popping a balloon, fractured mechanics, let's think about how this actually is going to play a part in the later segments of our experiment. So again, we have our pressure and our tension because of the elastic and the air within. We have our popping mechanism here and let's have fun with some science. Chris Ricker just told us about the last action, which was the popping of the balloon with something sharp on the end of a pendulum. And that's really important because of what this balloon is holding. And it's holding a bunch of marbles. And these marbles may look like ordinary marbles, but they're actually extraordinary marbles because of what they represent in terms of our chain reaction. So these marbles, as they're sitting and waiting in the balloon for it to be popped, they're storing up something called potential energy. And so this potential energy is at rest and it is dependent on the height, the velocity, and the mass of an object. And when it's put into action, it is transferred into something called kinetic energy. And a little bit later on, Christopher Rommel is gonna go into more depth about potential and kinetic energy, but it's really important for you to know right now that in physics, energy is never destroyed. It's only transferred from one place to another through different forces. And that's what we're explaining to you here. So I want you to think about a single marble and the potential that it holds inside of it. It's kind of like the potential that a person holds inside of themselves or a child or a student or an adult like myself. So you can think of yourself as the marble and you're in school and you're learning and you're absorbing all sorts of lessons and knowledge and information and your potential is growing as a person. It's greatness that is yet to be released and it's waiting for that one action or that chain reaction to put it into effect. So maybe for you, that action is graduating high school and choosing a college. Maybe it's choosing a major and maybe on your path, you might become a famous scientist who works hard to get rid of a terrible disease. Maybe you become the president of the United States and you make this country even better than it is. You might even become an astronaut and travel to distant planets and find life beyond Earth. That's what I call potential. As the marbles get released from the balloon, their potential energy decreases as their kinetic energy increases and they roll down this very smooth PVC pipe and they have gained enough velocity to be able to overcome the change in direction that the hill offers. And that's going to make it so that they can continue to travel and hit the first domino with their forward momentum. And going down this PVC pipe is kind of like if you've ever been at a water park and you go down a water slide because it's so smooth that it's almost like it's filled with water. Water acts like a lubricant on those slides and it helps your body get down to the bottom with as little friction as possible does the same exact thing for these marbles. The marbles are really good at it because they are spheres. And that's as opposed to something like a dice that is a cube. So they always have just one point of contact with the surface that they're rolling on, as opposed to the cube that has all of these sides. So if I was going to roll some marbles on a towel, it would be with more friction because this is not as smooth of a surface but then I can show you what it's like to roll some dice on the towel and they don't roll as far. So as the marbles are going down the slide and up the hill, they are hopefully generating enough forward momentum to knock down that first domino. But that's not going to be easy because all of these dominoes and these books in the future are all standing in a state of stable equilibrium. And that means that they're standing so still and solid that sometimes even a little nudge, they'll still be able to recover and bounce back to where they were standing. Kind of like a bowling pin. If you've ever hit one and it wobbles back and forth and it kind of threatens to fall over but then it never does and it stands right back up, it wasn't hit with enough force. So we're hoping that with not just one, but five marbles, we'll be able to generate enough force to knock down that first domino and the forward momentum and gravity will take care of the rest. I'd like to go a little bit more into depth about the science behind what we call 
the domino effect. So the domino effect you may be familiar with is where you have multiple pieces of something called a domino or any other thing that might topple over lined up next to each other and you knock the first one down and it knocks into the second one creating a chain reaction. So a domino, which is what we're using here, is about two inches tall by one inch wide and one quarter of an inch thick. And dominoes are really interesting because they are actually stable enough to stand, but they're also unstable enough that they can be knocked over with enough force because they're so tall and thin. So the first domino in our chain is full of potential energy. And that's just like the energy that was being stored up in the marbles that were waiting in the balloon to be popped by the pendulum. So that first domino is really important because when it falls, it falls with the force of gravity, turning that potential energy into kinetic energy. Theoretically, each successive domino could be larger than the last, which would amount to something as small as being held in your hand, making a really large impact when knocking the next one down. You might wonder, how can that happen? These calculations can be made using something called force vector analysis. Vector forces are functions of both the angle of the falling tile at the moment of impact, as well as the speed of the falling domino. So tiles that are nearer to an upright position, like this one right here that's standing straight up, they're exerting less force on the next object than by a tile that has completely toppled over almost. So here we still have 100% potential energy. The kinetic energy is way down. But as the angle of the tile starts to decrease, the kinetic energy starts to increase and the force that this tile is then hitting into the next tile and this tile is hitting into the next is greater and greater as it goes on. All of the variables that impact this chain reaction and this domino effect are time, force, and velocity. and they are all affected by the sheer distance between two tiles. So as the falling dominoes and Jenga blocks transfer their energy forward, we're encountered with something very interesting. And I'm gonna bring it here and show you. So this is a propeller and it sort of circles like that on an axis that might be similar to something like our solar system, where the center is our sun and the outer pieces are the objects and bodies that are orbiting around it in terms of gravity and their mass. So our hope is that this propeller will be hit with enough gravitational force to knock into it and knock the next book down. And can There are two forces working on bodies in motion in a circle. One of them is called centripetal force, and that one is one that Karen is gonna tell us more about later on in our experiment. But I'm gonna talk a little bit about centrifugal force. And that is defined as the force that is felt by an object moving in a curved path that acts outwardly away from the center of rotation. So if you've ever been on that ride at the amusement park where you're spinning in a circle and you're feeling like you're pressing up against the wall. And if that wall wasn't there, you feel like you'd probably float all the way out into space. That is called centrifugal force. And that is what is helping our propeller, which is a sort of lever, move. But it needs to be hit by the forward motion of the Jenga block 
to then activate moving into the next pieces, which are very much like the movements of the dominoes before. And they need to overcome the same static force that is keeping them stationary, that the dominoes had to. So on our next portion of our Rube Goldberg machine, we're going to see what happens after all the dominoes fall. We're going to come to our ramp right here with our book on top. The action that's going to follow the dominoes is when all the books fall, it will knock this last book over flat onto this ramp, where we hope that it will gain enough speed and motion to knock this rope out of the way, which will activate our next part. But before I go into that, I'd like to explain the science of this. So this might look familiar if you've been to a playground. Um, this, uh, this might be at uh, every playground you've ever been to, and it looks like a slide. Now, personally, the slide was one of my favorites growing up as a kid, but how does it work? What's the science behind it? What makes the book go down um, the ramp here? And I'm going to explain that to you right now. So this is a drawing of what a typical slide would look like when you go to a park. Basically how it works, you climb the ladder, you sit on top, and then when you let go, you are going to slide hopefully as fast as you can until you reach the bottom right here. And then you can do it all over again. Um, so what uh, is the science behind a slide of what makes it work? Uh, basically two things are going to uh, help or to answer the question when you go down a slide. One is motion. And the other one is energy. So motion is any movement that we do, whether that be walking, uh, uh, running, or in this case, sliding. And the energy is what is caused when we make that motion. Let me explain. There are two types of energies. The first one is potential energy. So potential energy happens when you are at the top of the slide. So let's put PE for potential energy. The further you go up the, 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 the slide, the more potential energy. That just basically means that the steeper the slide is and the higher you are on the slide, that is going to cause more energy as you come down and meet the bottom. Uh, the second energy we have is called kinetic energy. And kinetic might seem like a weird word or a strange word, but just basically think it as motion. So like motion energy. So that basically happens when we're going down the slide. KD. And that is the energy that we are letting out when we're going down and then eventually get stuck at the end. Um, so that is what's happening with our ramp. We have our book at the top here, and then when it gets knocked down by the domino, that creates the kinetic energy that goes down and hopefully knocks down our rope. Let me put that into a simpler term. So just basically imagine that your friend is at the bottom of the slide and isn't paying attention. And then you go down the slide and you meet that person at the bottom. What's gonna happen? Well, if you've ever done this at a playground, your friend will topple over and fall on the ground and not have a smile on their face. Um, that is because you have more energy than they do. Uh, when something that has more kinetic energy than something, uh, than something else meets, the one with greater kinetic energy is going to topple over the other ones. So that's so. Think of the rope as the, as your friend that got toppled over, and that is basically how our ramp is going to work. And go on to our next action on the Rube Goldberg machine. So coming back to our ramp, just imagine this at a, as a slide at the playground. This is you. This is the slide, and this is going to be your friend that you're going to unfortunately knock over. So. When the dominoes fall over, they're going to topple the book, slide down, and knock the rope down. Let's see that in action. Just like that.
Hello there. So, after the rope gets dislodged by the book, we now go on to our next action, which is a pulley system. So how that's gonna work, we have our rope here. And if you follow it along up, this goes into our fulcrum or where the rope rests. And on the other side of our rope, we have our sandbag. Once the rope gets dislodged uh, by the book, the weight of the sandbag is going to fall down onto the table down here by the use of gravity and then activate our next uh, action on the Rube Goldberg machine. Um, so how the pulley works, you need a couple of things. So you have our rope and you have our fulcrum and then you have a resistance. So I'll explain that piece by piece. The fulcrum is basically where the rope is going to rest or be supported. And that's typically in the middle. And it could be a wheel, it could be the carabiner right here, but it's just there to serve a purpose to help us uh, lift our sandbag. On the sandbag side, that is called the resistance line. And it is resisting because of gravity. Like I said, gravity keeps us all on the earth and gravity is trying to get the sandbag down back to the ground. Um, and on the other side, we have our effort line. Um, that's where we're going to be pulling from to get the sandbag in the air. So we're making an effort to pull against gravity and to get our sandbag into the air. And that is where we tape our line here. And when the book comes down and releases the rope, that is when the magic happens with our pulley. So let me just set the stage for you here. So say you and your friend are having fun and your friend here challenges you to lift them up. Um, he weighs 100 pounds. I'll put that right there so as you remember that. And he challenges you to lift him, but you can only pick up 50 pounds by yourself. A pulley is very useful because it's going to help you uh, pick up your friend, even though you can only pick up 50 pounds. And here's how. Um, normally, if you don't have a pulley, you're going to be lifting up, uh, uh, working against gravity. But with the help of the pulley, you're actually lift, or pulling down and gravity is helping you lift your friend up in the air. And another good thing about the pulley is that when you have the fulcrum helping you, it cuts or it feels like the weight of the person you're carrying is cut in half. So when the person you're trying to, or your friend you're trying to pull up weighs 100 pounds, it actually feels like you're lifting 50 pounds instead. So remember that that's the most you can carry. Even though your friend weighs 100, it feels like you're only uh, picking up 50 pounds. So like with the sandbag, say our sandbag weighs 10 pounds. With the pulley system here, it makes it feel like it is five pounds. So if you ever have to lift anything extremely heavy or you just want to make a bet with your friend, then pulleys would be the best way to go. So coming back to our pulley system and seeing what we just learned, we're going to put it into action now. So back again, we're going to have the book go down the, go down the ramp and knock down the book. And it's going to look just like this. Voila. Our next contraption involves something that you might have seen at a playground that is called a lever or a seesaw. So the way a seesaw works, you might have one person on one side and another person on the other. Um, it's basically a balancing act. If you put a, if one person has more weight or force on one side, the other side goes up. If there's more force or weight on this side, then the other side goes up. It's basically a game of tug of war. Um, so what we want to try to accomplish with our seesaw here, we want to create enough force on this side that it'll then launch the golf ball in the container into the air. Um, we want to create enough energy that'll uh, launch the ball away from us. And how we're going to do that involves uh, bits of science that we used on both the ramp and the uh, pulley system here. So just like the pulley system, our seesaw has our fulcrum, which is the uh, support for our seesaw. And on the board, the, the side that the golf ball is on is called the resisting force. That just means that it is uh, resisting the other side's energy or weight, which is none right now. And then this is, this is the effort force. 
and that'll be used by our sandbag to be dropped on and then hopefully create enough energy that gets that launches our golf ball into the air and continues on our Rube Goldberg machine. Now the word energy, I've said that before, that had to do with our ramp. So if you remember, there are two types of energies. We have potential energy, which involves a sandbag. So the lower the sandbag is, the lower the uh, potential energy we have when we release it. The higher the sandbag is, the more potential energy we have. So we want a good amount of energy here, so that's why we're going to have our sandbag higher rather than lower, so that when we release it, it creates enough energy to launch that ball like we want to. When the sandbag is released, that is the kinetic energy. That's the actual energy uh, being created, and that'll land right here, and hopefully that'll be enough. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Karen and I'm picking up where Christopher Rogamo left off and he was speaking to you about the sandbag and the potential energy there and how it's going to hit our seesaw um, and when that bag makes a downward force on this side, it's going to create an upward force on the side with the golf ball. So what that's going to do, if you can imagine if you were on a seesaw and someone dropped a boulder on one side and you weren't holding on to anything on this side, you would fly up into the air. So kind of like my little picture here. And you would become a projectile, which is exactly what our golf ball is going to become. It's going to go upward with a certain velocity. And eventually the only thing, a projectile basically is the only thing that's acting on it is gravity. That's gonna pull it back down to the ground. So gravity is sort of an invisible force that pulls two things together. So when it's getting pulled back to the ground, it's actually pulling on the earth and the earth is pulling on the ball. But being that the earth has so much more mass, um, it's pulling much harder. So gravity is holding us onto the ground and it's going to pull this ball back to the ground. So um, if gravity was not going to pull it back to the ground, this would go right off into space. Same thing if you were on a seesaw and someone um, or dropped a rock on it and there was nothing to hold you back to the ground, you would fly up into the air and that is due to inertia. So when the ball is here and it's not moving and there's no forces, it just stays where it is. Um, as soon as you put a force and you cause this ball to go into motion, it would stay into, in motion if there was nothing to stop it. So. So the inertia that would call, cause this ball or really anything in the universe to keep moving without anything to stop it um, is the same principle that we have with our inertia beads here. So when our golf ball gets thrown up into the air, it's going to pull on these inertia beads. And because they are in motion, they are just going to keep going until something stops it. Um, now what we have to stop it is this other string which is eventually gonna to go to feed our friend Flower here, who's watching us very carefully. Um, but we're not gonna let it go that far yet, but let me just show you how that looks. So if our projectile goes up, comes down with gravity, and so I'm gonna be the thing that stops it here, right? <laughs> You see how it would keep going. If I didn't stop it, and you see it keeps going, um, then it would keep going until it pulls on this rope. So I want to talk a little bit about the rope, and I know these beads are going to want to keep going onto the ground. Gravity is pulling it, and inertia is pulling it. So um, I want to talk a little bit about our action over here. And this is sort of like, almost like if you had a well, right? Or... Um, if you were on a monkey bar holding on and you were swinging on it, right? Or maybe a gymnast on an uneven bar that was swinging and sometimes they're really good and they can swing around in a full circle. I can't do that on a monkey bar, maybe you guys can. 
Um, but that force is called centripetal force. So now Angel spoke a little bit about centrifugal force before, which is a little bit different. So if you look, both of these have century, right? So center um, in the first part of the word, which means that it's all based on a circular motion and it has a center, right? So what Angel was talking about was centrifugal, which actually pushes the force in a circle, but towards the outside of the area that you're working in, right? So I don't know if you guys remember this thing, if you have come to Family Science Night uh, in person, this is called our spill knot, right? And we swung it around and we had some water in there and the water stayed inside the cup when we swung it around, all right? And I'm sure you guys remember that. And what's happening is the water is being pushed out. So that is centrifugal force. What we have here is centripetal force with a P, all right? And all of the energy, the force is actually going inward as it spins, it's not going outward. Um, so what that's going to do is make that cup twist and spin and dump all of the food in so our friend Flower here can have some snack. So I'm gonna let this, the inertia beads keep going and we're gonna see what happens. Design so it could just um, really pinpoint where the food was falling. Um, but as you can see, Flower got her snack anyway. All right, and you can see our cup has turned completely upside down. So again, remember like the monkey bars or a gymnast that is spinning on a central axis, right? That, that bar is acting as an axis and it's bringing the force inward. All right, and I think Flower is really happy right now. Now, if you do decide to make your own Rube Goldberg machine, just keep in mind that this machine took us many, many hours after many, many tries. So if you don't, uh, if you don't succeed on your first, second, even 10th try, then don't, uh, don't lose patience. You're going to get there. Um, try to push forward in the name of science. We'd love to see your machines. So we'd also like to again thank Con Edison for the generous donations that make these programs possible. And you can check us out every Thursday for a new Family Science Night. If you're interested in additional 
virtual programming from home, please visit our website at sigreenbelt.org, which is right here at the bottom of the screen. That's all. Bye. Thank you. Bye.